The last word on Today FM with Matt Cooper. Now our next guest has spent many years living and working in Afghanistan and indeed as an author and journalist has spent the last few months there escaping from the country from Kabul on the last commercial flight to depart at the weekend. She's an Australian, Lynn O'Donnell, thank you very much for joining us here on The Last Word of Today FM. And it just strikes me, there must be a sense of relief to have managed to escape on that last commercial flight. But given that you know the country so well, that you know so many people so well, how does it feel about leaving so many of these people behind and what potentially faces them? Oh, um, hi, Matt. Thank you. It's, um, I don't really feel too much relief, to be honest with you. I, I feel incredibly deep worry and concern for my friends and the people I know who are now trapped in Kabul. It's a it's a really um, dire situation and very uncertain and I think we are witnessing the beginnings of a civil war and who knows where that will go and what will happen to the people who have worked with the government, academics, people who have had jobs with um, the international uh, community, uh, NGOs, uh, companies, military. It's just so uncertain and so many of the people that I know, are they're keeping their heads low. They're not on um, email or on the internet or even on WhatsApp. They're, they're taking their identities down from social media. They're really very afraid of what the repercussions are going to be. You say there could be a civil war, but will there be a willingness and an ability to fight against the Taliban, particularly when you see the ease with which the Afghan army was overcome by them? Well, there's a lot of complex reasons for the Afghan uh, military sector having been rolled over at such a rapid rate by the Taliban, uh, not least of which is the corruption of the government of um, former President Ashraf Ghani, an incredibly uncharismatic person with micromanagement tendencies and um, surrounded by a very corrupt cabal of people and no real willingness to deal with the graft that saw an enormous amount of the money that was meant to go to supporting the military, not just the army, but the air force and the police who in Afghanistan were militarized and fought on the front lines, uh, was just pilfered. Logistical supply lines just didn't work. Um, So uh, will there be a resistance? There is already a resistance forming. Uh, The former first vice president, Amrullah Saleh, has um, tied up with um, the son of a former resistance leader last time round, Ahmad, Ma, uh, Ahmad Shah Massoud. Um, the younger is called Ahmad Massoud, and he and Amrullah Saleh are forming a resistance in the Panjshir Valley, um, which is outside of Kabul and has yet to come under Taliban control. We're also seeing some resistance in the cities. We've seen some demonstrations in uh, Kabul and another big city called Jalalabad. But we also don't know what's happening in the provinces. There is no journalistic presence anymore in the provinces. The Taliban have closed all that down. Many of the um, of Afghanistan's journalists fled to Kabul weeks ago. Uh, their uh, television stations and newspapers were closed down. Their radio stations were taken over by the Taliban. So at the moment, what we're looking at um, is a country through the prism of just one city, Kabul. We have no idea really what's happening outside of Kabul. And I think that if there is a resistance in Kabul, we can say that there will be support in other areas of the country too. Lynn, what should we make of these supposed assurances from the Taliban that nobody has anything to fear from them? Well, um, uh, I, I find it astounding that uh, people in senior political positions and uh, military uh, posts like the uh, British Army uh, head, General Sir Michael, no, General Sir whatever, I can't remember his name at the moment, but he came out yesterday. Nick Carter. The most, that's right, Nick Carter. Thank you for reminding me. He came out yesterday and said oh, that it's a new Taliban. They're reasonable. We can deal with them. You can't. Um, we have to keep in mind, it's in, it's so imperative that we do not forget that the Taliban are the biggest drugs producing and trafficking cartel in the world. They make billions of dollars from 
from um, producing and trafficking not just heroin but methamphetamine as well. They also have a very tight hold on the production of minerals and mining assets and um, that money should have been going for a long time to the Afghan state but it hasn't and so you know these are people who lie for a living and they have lied um, since their inception. Uh, they made a deal with the United States government with former President Donald Trump and they haven't kept any of the conditions. They said just on Sunday, we're on the outskirts of Kabul and we're not coming in. A couple of hours later, they came in. Now, that press conference that we saw um, earlier in the week was held in the government's information and media centre, which was built with donated money from the international community. And until two weeks ago, it was run by a very nice and a very popular um, and moderate man called Dawakan Manipal, and he was shot to death as he was leaving uh, Friday prayers, uh, Friday before last, and the Taliban claimed responsibility for his killing. Now, these are murderers, they're liars, they're drug traffickers, and they're misogynists, and nothing they say can be believed. Talk to me more about the misogyny and particularly the treatment of women and how women will need to fear for their safety and also for the repression of their rights. Yes, this has um, been something that I, I wrote about a couple of, um, uh, maybe a couple of months ago, times just taken on a, a treacle-like um, aspect. I'm, uh, I went to a, a district called Saigon um, in the Central Highlands that had been taken over by the Taliban for four days and a local militia had pushed them back into the mountains. I went in there and I met people who told me, and I met a, you know, a lot of people, and, and this information came from not only locals but from the governor and district officials as well as uh, women and their husbands in Saigon district, that when the Taliban came in, they announced that they wanted lists of names of women and girls and that those women included Included the wives of men fighting with the uh, state security forces, um, even those who'd been killed. And these women were to be married off to Taliban fighters. So um, I was able to confirm that this was their practice. There was just It just instilled incredible terror in them. And um, the reason I say verify was because I had been hearing rumours that this was happening in other areas that the Taliban had gone into as well. Um, the, this is essentially sex slavery and um, ethnic cleansing and it's all in the name of jihadist victory and war booty and this is the way they treat women. Already I'm hearing from people who are running television stations in Kabul where the women uh, newsreaders, um, Tolo TV for instance, took the women off the air on Sunday and Monday and then um, put them back on the air as newsreaders um, on uh, Tuesday but in much more restrictive um, clothing. And I'm in touch with the managing editor of the station and he said we chose to do it um, ourselves, so a bit of self-censorship going on, a survival uh, mechanism I guess. Um, but he said to me today, that the Taliban were coming to the station and they were making noises about taking women off the air altogether. Um, this doesn't all go well. Women are already being told in the big cities to give up their jobs, to go back to their homes, to give the men in their family the jobs that they have. Um, uh, that they're not allowed out of doors unless they are in full hijab and accompanied by a male relative. So it's a real back to the future um, retrograde step here. And um, my fear is that with the words that we hear from people like uh, General Sir Nick Carter, that there is going to be an effort to... Um, uh, downplay the severity of the conditions that the Taliban are going to, well, are already and intend to um, uh, enforce on Afghan women. But we've also got to remember that it's not only Afghan women who are vulnerable. There are other groups who are vulnerable too, not least of them the Hazara people who are an ethnic minority and are Shia rather than Sunni and um, have been uh, the subject of uh, mass murders in the past by the 
the Taliban. Um, they have an awful lot to lose. Um, there are also people who worked for the international community, the international military, people who uh, work in international academia, run think tanks. I have friends who are in hiding because the Taliban have gone into their offices, interrogated staff. Um, uh, one of my friends says that his think tank that he started up um, uh, a couple of years ago is still being occupied by the Taliban who are going through records um, very, very closely. So there's an awful lot of people who have a lot to fear. It's not just women, though they are the most visible, so but it's across the board. What can be done for these people? So is this a question of trying to evacuate as many of them as possible by the Americans, the British and all those others who have responsibility but if that was to happen, what sort of country would be left? And you speak about a civil war, which would be terrible and there would be enormous bloodshed and loss of lives. But is that now to be necessary to make sure that this mob who were previously removed from power aren't allowed to impose their terrible regime again? Oh, so what can be done? Um, at the moment, there is um, a, a very uh, ardent effort by people who served in the military in Afghanistan to get uh, the people who acted as their interpreters on the battlefield out. Um, uh, the Americans are giving special visas to people who worked for their embassies, for their NGOs. Um, you know, there's an enormous number of people, really, who qualify for um, these special visas to come out. Um, the French have airlifted a lot of people, the Germans too. But what we're seeing is a brain drain and um, specific groups targeting specific groups inside Afghanistan, um, uh, media as airlifts as well. Um, what I feel, yes, of course, we have to be as compassionate and as supportive um, of, of people because their lives are on the line as we possibly can. But what we're doing is we are removing the brightest and the best of the Afghan population. And um, what I would like to see is a much more concerted effort from the top of government and uh, big organisations, media organisations, for instance, the military, um, to pressure um, uh, their governments, um, the British, Irish, Australian, EU, uh, America, to put pressure on the government as it emerges in Afghanistan to abide by the constitution. They have a constitution that guarantees free speech, women's rights, equality, human rights, all of that sort of stuff that um, people have come to take for granted over the past two decades and say, we are not going to recognise you. We are not going to um, give you any support and the diplomatic um, and political legitimacy that you crave and need to function as a proper country, a member of the, the, you know, the community of nations, unless you abide by these conditions. The problem is that um, if you look at the landscape in Kabul at the moment, the only embassies that are open are China, Russia, Iran and Pakistan. Now, China and Russia are on the Security Council of the United Nations, so they have veto power. So any um, any effort through the U the UN to um, uh, sanction whatever uh, the Taliban uh, government does um, will just be vetoed by China and Russia, who have their own interests. So it's becoming a very murky geopolitical situation. What what are what what can we do for Afghan people? Mm -hmm. um, it, it remains mm -hmm. to be seen. Lynn O'Donnell, thank you very much for taking the time to join us here on The Last Word of Today FM. Uh, Lynn has written an extraordinarily good piece for Tortoise, the website, if you want more information on what is actually happening in the country. Lynn, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. And you, Matt, thank you.